Here you go. Just straight behind you here. My question is uh, more of a general question about the mind. Yeah. Um, is it true to say that mind is a product of our emotions? Our thoughts and mind is a product of our emotions? What we need to do, Igor, is separate what God created the mind and the brain for from what we're finishing up using it to be. So God created... Uh, yes, mind. God created our mind. Our spirit body's mind is a creation of God, just like our physical body's brain is a creation of God. But we have to look at how God intended it to be used in comparison to how we finish up using it. So, so what's the primary... All right, well, let's look at the difference between the two in terms of how God intended it and then how we finish up using it. Okay, so, so here's our parent, God. Here's our half of our soul. And here's our spirit body. But let's focus on our spirit body's mind in this case. And our physical body. So that's the spirit body, physical body. And let's focus on our spirit, our physical body's brain. So we're talking the brain here and the mind here and the soul. And remember, we're a half of a soul, so, so we're not a complete soul. There's another half of our soul. And once you introduce the other half of the soul into the equation, the feelings become even more complex than what I'm going to describe. And we'll, we'll do that in a minute and introduce the second part and see the relationship. So, so you've got your soul, your spirit body's mind, and your physical body's brain. And what finishes up happening when you first arrive on the earth is that the physical body's brain becomes the primary method of control of your physical body. So in other words, as soon as you're hungry, you want to eat. If you can't eat as soon as you're hungry, what, is it, what do you do? You have a big cry because you're a baby at that point and, uh, and the only way to get fed is to have somebody else do it for you. And so you have a big cry and eventually that cry lets the person who's caring for you know that they need, you need to be fed and so you get fed. So it's an instant reaction, it's a reaction of the brain to these other, these other responses that are occurring within the body. And in fact, the brain itself is interacting with these responses. It tells you, I'm hungry, I need, the body needs food, the body needs rest, the body needs comfort, and so forth. All of those basic things the body needs are told straight away, and the brain responds, and we have an automatic response. So that's the physical body. You could call that, um, what we've called it in the in the um, Paget messages is the animal, if you like. Does that make sense? So that's the part of us that uh, finishes up, uh, if we're not careful with our spirit body, it finishes up becoming animalistic, in fact, where we're just totally driven by our physical body senses. And there are people, historically, um, particularly if you think back to the so-called caveman days, that were driven primarily by these animal instincts and very little other feelings dominated their existence other than the animal instincts that were present inside of the body. So all that was was the brain responding to the body and since there's no other check upon what it decided to do, it just went out and did its thing. So let's say it was hungry and there was no other food other than another person, it would just kill the other person and eat their flesh instead because there's no moral mo no morality driving it so that's what I'd call animal, and the animal part of ourselves we're a physical organism and the physical organism itself is animal in nature very very similar to any other animal just more highly developed in its brain in fact and there's a reason why it's more highly developed in a brain that's related to the spirit body and the soul, but we'll talk about that later, maybe. Okay, so that's our operation of our physical body. The spirit body has a mind of its own, 
And it has the ability to influence the physical body's brain as well. And in fact, this is, it is the physical body's mind that is the primary storage of data, of information, memories. This is why a person who's in their physical body, who has a stroke, where a part of their brain actually dies, they temporarily lose their memory of a certain type. Sometimes it's even of a mem their memory of how to actually use parts of their physical body is lost, but also their memories about different things that have happened in their life often get lost. And then, over a period of time, they regain it all. And that tells us, it's quite obvious, that the physical body's brain does not store the information. The information, because the physical body's brain got damaged, and somehow, when it's got repaired, for some reason, the information that it stored before returns. And even if a part of that brain dies completely, sometimes another part of the brain develops enough to replace some of the functionality. So that tells you that the functionality must come from another location. Does that make sense? Now, it comes from the spirit body's mind, the functionality of all those kind of things. So the spirit body's mind is capable of huge amounts of storage of information and memories, and uh, in fact, everything that you've ever done, uh, may, for many of us, is actually stored in the mind, but there are limitations upon the spirit body's mind, which we'll discuss in a minute. So far, everyone is with me? Yeah. Now, the mind can influence the brain, and this is what the development of what you would call the higher, a lot of people call the higher self, if you like, So now the animal, the brute, is no longer the dominant being of a human, but rather the spirit body's mind kicks into play and goes, well, hang a sec, this isn't logical for me to go out and murder another human, particularly if I've got other sources of food available to myself. And if I murder other humans and I'm affecting them and their life, which isn't a very loving thing to do, so we, we can actually start to use our brain, uh, our spirit body's mind's uh, desire to become more moral, and we finish up developing. We develop beyond the animal, who would just go out and do whatever it wants, into this higher being who's capable of determining what it, what it wants, and capable of self-determination to a large degree, and capable also of understanding the impact of what, it, what the brute wants, and curbing the impact, in fact. Now, in your day-to-day -day life, you are constantly doing this. You, the animal, you know, wants something to eat. What stops you from just walking outside, grabbing, grabbing a magpie, wringing its neck, pulling off its feathers and eating it? Because that's what the brute would do. Well, there's all sorts of things in your brain that prevents you from taking those particular actions some of which is a desire for beauty, some of which is a desire to, to um, do things that don't harm other things, some of which is a, just, just a desire to, um, to have something that's a bit tastier than a magpie. Not that I've ever tasted one. Well. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why you might, might choose a different action once you're in this higher self. But the brute would definitely do that given no control, given no other external form of control. And it's our spirit body's mind that can provide a lot of that control. And so what happens is a lot of our spirit friends in particular, but also people on earth, finish up developing this mind, developing through logic, if you like. And we can develop uh, that part of ourselves through logic. Then there's this soul, the soul that the majority of people on earth are totally driven by, actually, but are completely unaware of in the majority of cases. Now, I would call that the true self, not the higher self, but the true self. That is the real you, the true you, 
the one who you really are. Now in, there, in that soul, there's a lot of things that God's placed there. And God's placed personality. God's placed a desire for love, a desire for truth, a passionate desire to understand yourself and understand the environment and the universe, in other words. A lot of these things are instinctual for the soul. But unfortunately, what happens is because we're quite blocked between the soul and the spirit body and then often we are also quite blocked between the spirit body even and many people are in this state on earth blocked between the spirit body and the physical body unfortunately on the earth our spirit our physical body often dominates much of our thinking still because of its needs so it's need and then the spirit body's denial of different emotions cause it to block the soul and so the soul has a whole set of needs which don't get satisfied. And so what we finish up doing is coming up through our mind, the usage of our mind, we come up with other ways to satisfy what are standard ways that we could use to satisfy these particular longings in the soul. And so what finishes up happening, if you drew it differently, you'd have your soul, you've got your mind of your spirit body, and then you've got your brain of your physical body and for most people that's how they live their life where that is the highest priority and this is a less higher priority and that's the lowest priority that's how they live their life now of course that's going to mean that the animal takes precedence over all other things and then when the animal no longer desires the precedence, in other words, there's no pressing need for the animal to take over, then some of the spirit body will drive the action. And when there's no driving emotional need for the mind to take action, now we're in our, we can feel our soul. But unfortunately for the majority of us, we spend most of the time in between these two places here. Now, once we, so that, that's how we often then begin to develop on the the, on the natural love path, in other words, learning how to use love naturally, what we finish up doing is we finish up developing a lot in the mind. So the mind starts to take precedence over the brain. So what finishes up happening, once this happens to a certain degree, and it has never happened completely on earth to a single person, but, but it has happened on earth, uh, on the spirit world, to every person who's reached the sixth dimension of the spirit world. What's happening there is their mind, their spirit body's mind is now dominant and the physical body, if it still existed on earth, would be subservient to it. In other words, the brain would be subservient to the mind. This is where you get some people on earth, and there's all sorts of experiments that have happened in the spiritual, uh, in the spiritual world on earth about this. This is where you can get people, for example, no longer feeling hungry even if their body is saying, I'm hungry. Right? And they no longer feel hungry. Or you get people where their body is saying, I want some sexual activity, but their mind is saying, you don't need that anymore. Right? So, so in other words, they have a celibate life without any trouble at all maintaining it. Right? You get uh, people uh, doing many other things as a result of this swap over that occurs. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, um, that is developing the mind, in a, in a, the spirit body basically is now being developed, to dominate the physical animal, and, but unfortunately it also dominates the soul. That's the drawback. So the drawback is you still feel quite distant from the soul's actual emotion. Right? And that's the problem with that. Now the way we want it to be, if, and this is the way God designed it to be, is this way. Where the soul takes the highest, sorry, the soul takes the highest, I wrote down male there for some reason, but the soul takes the highest priority, right? And our spirit body's mind takes the next priority and our brain is of the least significance to us. Our physical body's brain. Now, everything both the physical and spirit bodies do is do just done to serve the soul's desires. And because it's the soul that is capable of connecting to God, 
we now also have the potential of receiving divine love and this soul growing. You see, the soul under the previous description, the, anything coming through into the soul in the previous description had to pass through, firstly, the mind and also even the brain of the animal before it, the soul really embraced it. Now, for the majority of people, what happens is there's a mixture of things going on on a day-to-day -day basis or a moment-by-moment -moment basis. There are some things where you have no resistance at all in your mind and no resistance at all in your physical body or your physical body's brain to doing. And so in those instances, your soul is the dominant force. And for, some of, you know, for many of us, this is the case in our day-to-day -day life. We have some things that are just dominated by our soul. But then for many of us, we also have the opposite thing occurring too, where our mind has become dominant or our, or our physical demands have become dominant and we just fulfill those first no matter what our soul says. So if our soul's saying, no, no, have some integrity, have some integrity, have some integrity, right? And our, and our animal self saying, I need, I need sex now, I need sex now, I need sex now. Right? And, the, and, the, and the other part's going, no, no, have some integrity, have some integrity, you're married, have some integrity. And if the animal part of us is dominant, then we will finish up going off and cheating on our partnership. That's guaranteed. It's only when our mind or our soul is more dominant on that particular matter that we'll actually have a different action. So for many of us, we have soul dominance in some aspects of our life, and then we have completely the opposite in other aspects of our life. So our soul is actually the most subservient thing in our being and our brain, which is just receiving physical stimuli, right? And that becomes the most dominant thing. The physical stimulus that is driving a certain action becomes the dominant thing. Now, if we really, when we become at one with God, the soul is always the dominant thing. There is never any aspect of ourselves that is driven by our spirit body's mind or our physical body's brain anymore. And this gets to how God designed it. So let's look at how God designed it. How God designed it was that the soul controls, without any resistance, controls both the spirit body and the physical body completely. That's how God created it to be, that the soul controls both bodies simultaneously and completely. In other words, the physical body cannot take an action unless the soul decides upon the action. And the spirit body even cannot take an action unless the soul decides upon it. And in fact, during the transition that God designed, which happens between the sixth, the seventh and the eighth dimension, what finishes up happening is that before, up until the sixth dimension, the mind was the dominant factor. But in the seventh dimension, you lose the dominance of the spirit body's mind. And by the time you eat the, reach the eighth dimension, you no longer think about doing things anymore because you're already doing them by the time you thought about them. Right. And... Everything you do is harmonious with love as well, without you having to try, without you having to force the action upon yourself. So the way God designed it was that these two bodies were just the tools of the soul. Do, do you see the difference? Whereas the way we often operate before then is that the soul and the spirit body become the tool of the physical body. Unfortunately for many of us, the animal part of ourselves drives the rest of it. So therefore, the animal part of ourselves, you could say, is the dominant force and the soul and the mind are just its tools to get what it wants done. And it doesn't care often about the results. 
It doesn't care. And the only time it actually finishes up caring is when the soul's condition degrades so much that the primary feeling is one of pain. And once it gets to that point, the physical body usually gives up its dominance and allows there to be some other form of dominance that creates less pain. So unfortunately for many of us on earth, we use our physical body in ways that are totally out of harmony with love. We degrade in our condition. As we degrade in our condition, our pain worsens. Our physical condition worsens. We get old, we get wrinkly, we start getting all like a shriveled up prune in the end. If you look at an older person, really, that's how it is, isn't it? And, and why is that? It's because the soul is getting darker, darker, and now it's having more and more and more and more of an effect on the spirit body. Right? So, and therefore it's having more of an effect on the physical body, it's degrading its condition and eventually we get to the point where we either die and pass in the spirit world and then come to terms with how bad we look because we can now see it in our spirit form or many of us on earth go, wow, I'm starting to feel really bad, I need to change my ways, we go. So like if one of the ways is smoking all the time, and we're starting to cough a lot and we get emphysema and we get all these other things and eventually the pain and we go to the doctor and the doctor says you've got to give up smoking otherwise you're going to die. And we go, okay, I think it's time for me to give up smoking now. So we're willing to now make the physical body subservient to the deeper emotional pain that we're receiving and as a feedback mechanism actually from our soul in a way. And so what's happening is our true self now has to, has to have a bit more dominance, otherwise we will die. And we're afraid of death and so fear causes us to decide in our mind that we should take a different course of action. Even though our body is telling us, no, I badly need these cigarettes, you know, to keep myself functional and keep me alive and keep me enjoying my life. And the doctor is saying, no, no, but if you do that, you're going to die. And so we go, no, in our mind we go, well, it's not logical for me to die because I can't then use my body to do other things that I actually like if I'm dead. So I need to change my way. So I change my way in that particular direction, in that particular thing. So I don't give up food still or other things that are damaging me and I don't say all food's damaging them and just the food that does damage you I'm not giving up that yet because it's the smoking that's killing me but then let's say after we give up smoking we start eating a lot more generally that's the case isn't it when you give up cigarettes and you start eating a lot more and now I'm starting to whack on the weight so I go back to the doctor and the doctor says you've just now substituted food <laughs> cigarettes with food and if you keep going the way you're going you're going to be so obese you're going to get heart disease and you're, and you're going to take 10 or 15 years off your life usually that's the case at least and so now that he's triggered another part of our fear well you know I can't get my other needs met with this body if I continue to eat too much so now I've got to go on a diet All right so I now start being selective, so my mind now starts selecting what I eat in order to promote some longevity, in order to live a bit longer so that I can enjoy my body a bit more. That's the reason generally why we finish up doing it. So now our mind has overcome the brute with regard to its, deny, its desire for certain types of foods. The mind saying, no, you're not allowed to have that food. You're not allowed. This is why it's so hard, you know, because you, your mind says that and you get nice and slim again and then you go off your diet. And because the soul's unhealed emotional reasons as to why it wants those things are still happening and the physical body is just responding to that soul unhealed emotion, so therefore the physical body has its own desires, it needs that serotonin fix that gets squirted into the brain constantly that uh, every time we eat certain types of food, so it needs these chemical fixes. Um, and so what does it do? It demands that you eat the same foods that you gave up. And so a year later, you're back to the size you were again. And that's why we have that term yo-yo dieting, you know, down, up, down, up, down, up. And the reason why is because the actual sole reason for it to occur hasn't been addressed. And we're having to use our mind in a certain direction, force ourselves into a direction that we really, at some level, do not want to take. And this is the problem we face. 
But when our soul becomes dominant, now we would never ever, not because we wouldn't even have a feeling that we want to eat those particular foods that cause me to put on weight. You won't even like them anymore at all. You won't be attracted to them at all. You will not eat them because you don't even like them anymore. Stuff that you used to like, once you work through the different emotional reasons why you eat those particular things, you can't eat it anymore. And the body doesn't get its fix anymore that it used to get. And so you give them up completely and you never return to them. So I used to, for example, I used to like drinking wine. Who else likes drinking or liked? Yep. And I had a big collection of it and I was really into it in the sense of uh, I was pretty selective with my wines and, and I used to enjoy the taste of it more than... I never got drunk, but I used to enjoy the taste of it more than anything else. And, uh, and so I had a fairly large collection. And then once I worked through certain emotions, I would have a drink of wine and it tasted like poison. Like the same thing that I used to really enjoy the taste of before, I couldn't even smell anymore, let alone taste. Before I'd go, ah, oh, that smells good, mate. <laughs> right? And then, and then down, down with it just as if at a time generally, yeah, that tastes so good. Get out my olives and my cheese and my other things, right, <laughs> with it. And, uh, you know, if, if it was some kind of whiskey or something like that, I'd get out my strawberries and the other things with it. It was a real ritual. And, and once, we, uh, once I dealt with the emotion of it, the physical body smelt the same thing and the response was totally different. So now when I smell uh, some alcohol, it smells like turpentine to me. Now, most of you wouldn't drink turpentine unless you were a pretty hard up alcoholic, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I'd smell, oh, ooh, you know, that doesn't smell any good. It smells more like somebody needs to light and put a match to it than it does to go in my own body. And, and so there's, there's not a physical decision that I made, not an intellectual decision to give up drinking. It wasn't an intellectual choice at all. My body was just saying to me, I don't want this anymore. So the body was now no longer desiring the same things. The animal no longer even had the same desires that it had before. And this is where, when we're soul dominant, we start to realise that actually the soul, this soul, does actually at some level control everything else. And this animal is actually controlled by the soul and its emotions and its feelings. And the spirit body's mind can actually be controlled and the spirit body itself can also be controlled by this soul as well. And that's how God made you to be, to be soul dominant. The things you enjoy the most are all the things that are harmonious with that soul's growth in love and truth including the very food you eat and including the drinks you drink including everything that you do and the soul then becomes the dominant part of yourself and what we're learning to do is to go on the divine love path or let's call it what what i used to call it in the first century on the way to god's love because it's the only way so it's the way the narrow path that leads to life on that path there is only one path, God designed it, and on that path, your soul will eventually dominate everything you do in a manner that's harmonious with love and truth. That's what will happen on that path. And you will never need to fight against another negative or unloving emotion or behaviour again once you reach that condition. That's the reality of that condition. So if we can see that this self is the self that God intended to drive this self and this self, and we start to see the physical form and the spirit form as just a motor or a robot that allows the half of the soul to experience itself. That's all it does. These are just input devices 
for the half of the soul to receive an experience. That's all they are, just a, an input device. And once we see these things as input devices and, be, and start to allow the soul to dominate, then we make a lot of changes and we, we're capable of actually making changes very rapidly without fighting them and without them being hugely painful. What causes most of our pain, in fact, is the brain and the mind fighting against the desire for the soul to be dominant. In other words, the brain and the mind want dominance. And that's what causes the majority of our pain, both physical pain and other forms of pain, emotional pain and so forth, is our desire for these things to dominate the soul. And we taught, we taught ourselves, or it would be best saying, other people have taught us from a very young age that our soul needs to be subservient to their mind. And in fact, for the majority of us, our childhood is this, our soul being made subservient to the mind of our parents. And so after, by the time we become, you know, seven, eight years of age, we are so used to being subservient to the mind of our parents that the only areas of our soul that we connect to are the areas of our soul that our parents thought were allowable. They're the only areas we connect to by that age, generally. And what we're attempting to do is to reverse that reverse that process, which feels, as Graham mentioned earlier, feels like it's a regression almost, initially. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any questions about...